This is Living Waters of Grace, the teaching ministry of Clark Lawfer, Senior Pastor of Calvary Chapel of Westmoreland County of Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Now here's Pastor Clark as he continues teaching through God's Word. From Genesis to Revelation, there is not one situation that you can run into in this life where you can't see it covered in this word. Nothing. But if you do read any books other than this, make sure that those books line up totally with this. Not, well, some of it does, but some of it questions. Some of it just calls you to think outside the box. No, we don't need to think outside the box. We need to think inside the word. Do you read secular books? What are they teaching you? Today, Pastor Lewis reminds us to line up everything we read with the Word of God. We need to fill our minds with things that honor our Heavenly Father and cannot let worldly wisdom seep into our thought patterns. The Bible says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. God's way is the way to life. In this upcoming message, we're advised to keep our thoughts inside the Word and not outside that box. Now, here's Pastor Lewis in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4 with today's edition of Living Waters of Grace. Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Can you imagine when we are with the Lord and we are with Him for eternity, how it's going to be one long worship time with the Lord? It's going to be an endless hallelujah to the King. And we can have that here now, being in the family of God and being in Christ Jesus. Our worship time should be a endless hallelujah to the King even now. Amen. Okay, let's pray. And then we're going to go into the word of God. Amen. Father God, in Jesus name, Lord, we do thank you. We thank you, Father, because once again, as we have, and we thank you that you have given us your word, not my word or anyone else's word. Lord, you've given us your word that we have the truth in front of us, Lord, that we can read it every day. But we thank you, Lord, that we have fellowship with you, Lord, when we spend time in your word. And now, Father, I ask you, Lord, for your power, your anointing. I ask you, God, that you would just be with us today. Your word says where two or three are gathered in your name, that you would be in the midst of us, Lord. There's a lot more than two or three here today. Father, we pray that you would just be in the midst of us today, that your love would just be overpouring. We pray, Father, that your power, Lord, would just drench us, the anointing, and that it would not only bring the truth of your word and reveal the truth of your word, Lord, but that it would be a cause us, our hearts, to be receptacles, Lord, to be able to receive your word, and that it would grow in us, Lord, and cause us to grow and to look more like your son, Jesus Christ. Father, help me. I need, Father, for you to speak the words, Lord, for you to just use me as an instrument of labor. For your will and for your work, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this is a letter that Paul has written to his beloved son in the spirit, Timothy. And it's a very instructional letter, highly instructional. And I love reading these kind of letters. I love reading these kind of epistles because it gives us very clear instruction as to what it is that pleases God and what it is that We are to be looking to God for the work that he's doing in us. So it's like a father who was sitting down. And I thought about that even this past week as I was sitting down with my father. It's like a father sitting down with a young son and he's giving him instructions in life and giving him instructions on the things of the spirit, things in the spirit. Timothy's a young pastor and he needs the instruction from his mentor and his father in the faith. So it's almost like if you can picture Paul sitting there and Timothy basically sitting at his feet and listening to the instruction that Paul has received through spending time with the Holy Spirit. And if you remember the last thing that was discussed in chapter 3, verse 16, the verse says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness or God-likeness. As it was God who was manifested in the flesh, he was justified in the spirit and he was seen by angels and he preached 
among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and then he was received up into glory. And we talked about that the last time that we talked about 1 Timothy. But it's this doctrine of faith that we believe that Jesus was God in the flesh who came to be an earthly example for us to be able to actually see the word of God. But now here in in chapter 4, Paul gives Timothy a warning and gives him a prophecy. He starts it off with a prophecy as a warning. And this is something that he's talked about before, about these doctrines coming into the church. Back in in chapter 1, he said, preach no other doctrine, Timothy. Don't preach anything else other than the doctrine that we have given you. And Galatians says, if anybody preaches anything other than what we've given you, let them be accursed. I don't care if it's an angel. If they come and preach anything other than what we have given you, let them be accursed. So early here in this particular letter, we see that Paul is giving another warning. So let's take it up in verse one. Let's read it through to verse five. He says, now the spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified. By the word of God and prayer. So we look at this and we say, well, Paul says the the, the spirit expressly says, and, and what that word can also mean is that the spirit explicitly says, or it clearly says, or it clearly points out, Timothy. I don't know if it was a situation where Paul was looking in the Old Testament, was reading some old prophecies, or if it was something recently that Paul had been praying about and the spirit revealed this to Paul. And it was probably both. But he says the spirit expressly or it clearly says that in the latter times, deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, that people will heed to these things. Some are going to depart from the faith and they're going to give heed to these deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So when he says in the latter times, that's much different than talking about the latter, de- the latter days. He's not talking about the end times. This is the church that is beginning. Paul had planted many churches and he's saying that in the latter times after my departure or when I'm gone, as he spoke about in Acts chapter 20, when he was talking to the elders in Ephesians, he says, after I leave here, there are going to be men who are going to come in with all these deceiving doctrines and teaching things. They're going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. And Paul is saying here that in that latter times, after these things, after this point where the churches have been established in the latter times, there are going to be people who are going to come in and they are going to bring deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Very powerful words. Deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, not just false doctrines. He's saying that they're going to have their origin in demonic Warfare and demonic power, demonic influence. And he's talking about the fact that these, these people are coming in with spirits that are, um, and, and given doctrines that are going to be contrary to the word of God. It's going to be doctrines that people are going to come in with and cause you to question what you know about the truth. And anything that you hear or anything that you read that causes you to question the truth of the doctrine is not of God. It is of the devil. It is of the devil. And it has its roots. What he's talking about here actually has his roots back in Genesis. Back in Genesis chapter 2, when the evil one came to deceive Eve, the first thing he did was made her question what God had said to Adam. That was the first thing he did. So I'm going to go back there and I'm going to look at just a couple of things just to point out how these doctrines of demons, how it started back in Genesis. So we go to Genesis chapter two and we look at verse 16 and 17 and it simply says this. And the Lord commanded the man saying that this was the commandment of the Lord of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in a day that you eat of it, 
you shall die. Now, that's the commandment of the Lord. That's the word of the Lord. That's the truth because God only speaks truth. But look at what the devil did. Now, this is when the doctrine of demon comes in. Look in chapter three, and we're going to look right here at the end of verse one. And he said to the woman, speaking of the serpent, who was the image of the demon, of the demonic spirit. And he says to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Look how he tries to get her to question what God has said. That's what doctrines of demons do. They try to get you to question the truth of what God has said. And then if you go over to verse four, it says, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. How many doctrines are out there where they're trying to uh, infuse this false strength, this false power into people into thinking that you yourself are God? You yourself were in control of your fate. You yourself were in control of what you do in life. You were in control. No one else has to be in control. Those Christians are crazy. They're weak people. They're dependent on somebody else or something else. But you, you have power. You're your own God. Doctrines of demons. Doctrines of demons. Listen, God has given us his word. It has everything in it that we could possibly need. From Genesis to Revelation, there is not one situation that you can run into in this life where you can't see it covered in this word. Nothing. But if you do read any books other than this, make sure that those books line up totally with this. Not, well, some of it does, but some of it questions. Some of it just calls you to think outside the box. No, we don't need to think outside the box. We need to think inside the word, not outside the box. So just make sure that whatever you read, that is consistent, totally consistent with the word of God, because it only takes just a little bit to take you off to the right or to take you off to the left. And that's what was happening here. And he says here that they will depart from the faith. Now, that depart doesn't mean that they're going to, you know, walk away from salvation or walk away from their salvation or walk away totally from God. But they will depart from the teaching of Christian ethics. They're going to walk away from the core things of the gospel. The core things of the truth, of the doctrine of God, they're going to walk away from that. They're going to stop teaching things that are rooted and grounded in the faith and start teaching other things that have come in with these doctrines of demons and these deceiving spirits. And it says they're going to give heed to those things. That means they're going to pay attention to it. They're going to actually turn toward those things. And after they do that, and the way that they're going to do it, the way it's going to be uh, played out is that they're going to be speaking lies and hypocrisy, as it says there in verse 2. They're going to be speaking lies and hypocrisy. They're going to be hypocrites, like Jesus referred to the, the Pharisees as hypocrites. They live hypocritic lives. They try to look one way and try to act like they're one way, but really all the bondage that they put on other people, they themselves can't do it. And these are going to be teachers who are going to be trying to look holy, try to look religious, but their doctrine is totally contrary to the things of God, totally contrary to the things of God. They're going to be uh, people who give heed to these things, and they're going to speak these lies in hypocrisy. And as a result of doing that, look at what it says at the end of verse 2. As a result of doing this and doing it over time, totally refusing the truth, Standing away from the truth, standing apart from the truth, speaking consistently things that are evil, things that are contrary to the word of God. After they do that for so long, their conscience then becomes seared with a hot iron. And that's an interesting picture. My wife and I want to go to Montana and Wyoming. We like to travel and we want to go to Montana and Wyoming. We want to do a dude ranch. I know, you're picturing me on a horse. I know you are. Said, what in the world is he going to do on a horse? I know. But believe it or not, I actually love horses. Uh, we, we ride, in fact, our first date was uh, horseback riding. I took a horseback ride, believe it or not. But anyway, we want to go to a dude ranch because we know that on a dude ranch, one of the things that they do is that they brand cattle. They brand young horses. They brand these things. And, and I never really considered the whole art of branding or the practice of branding or what it meant until I started studying this. 
And, and, and what's interesting about it is that the branding actually not only burns the flesh, the top flesh, but it actually burns the nerve endings so that they become numb back there. They become numb back there what I'm, is what I'm told. And, and they can't feel. They can't feel. And I've heard people talk about having things cauterized where they lose feeling in certain areas of their body, which is, and it's almost like the same thing, this cauterization or this branding. And this is exactly what happens when you walk in disobedience to God over a long period of time. The conscience becomes branded. It becomes insensitive to the things of God. You don't even be convicted anymore. You're not convicted anymore. Then you get further and further away and you hear his voice further and further away to the point that you can't even hear his voice anymore. You become insensitive to righteousness, become insensitive to goodness. And this is what happened with these false teachers. Their, their conscience are seared with a hot iron and they don't have the ability to feel the truth anymore, to know the truth, to be able to sense the truth. They don't have it anymore. Their hearts are damaged. So he says here in verse 3, and one of, the one of the things that they began to teach, having this branded or this seared conscience, one of the things that they began to teach is forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. Now, the forbidding of marriage. So now, since they have turned away from the doctrine of God and turned away from the truth of the gospel, they now want to forbid what God has given all of us a right to. It's clear that the Bible does not teach forbidding of marriage. It clearly teaches marriage. In fact, it's one of the first institutions that God created. But the devil, these demons and these, and these doctrines say, no, we got to stay away from it. If you want to really be holy, if you want to really look righteous, if you want to really look religious, don't get married. Don't get married. No, no, that is a doctrine of demons. It's a doctrine of demons. We are to get married. Now, Paul says that there are people who have the gift or who have the, the heart. They're like, well, you know, there's two ways you can be a eunuch, right? We know that. The one way is obviously the removal of body parts. But the other way is the fact that you just decide that you will not marry and you will not have to deal with that kind of pleasure or be involved in that kind of pleasure to, to be with a wife, okay? That's another way. But that's not what this is talking about. This is actually forbidding people to get married. Paul says that he has the gift to be able to do that, but if that's not you, then you need to marry because it's better to marry than to burn with lust. So marriage is definitely something that God gives us a right to do. And then he says, in commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So now we think about Peter, who had grown up in the law, grown up under the law. And when God began to present to him that he, listen, th this is grace now. We're in the New Testament now. And we're not forbidding you to eat things anymore the way that it was in the, in the law because it was God showing Israel his perfect righteousness, his perfect righteousness. But now all these things lead to Jesus Christ. We don't have to do that. So that the Lord showed Peter the example of all these different animals that at one time Peter would not have eaten. He called them unclean. God said, don't ever call unclean what I call clean. Arise and eat. And if we go back again, back to Genesis, in creation, when God created these animals, he said they were good. Everything God created is good. So no, we don't have to stay away from these things. And, and it's just a matter of control. These doctrines of demons are always doing things to try to control or to instill fear into people. It's being religious and legalistic. And Paul said, no, stay away from that. That is not true. Those are doctrines of demons for people who forbid to marry and command to abstain from staying from foods. I love Reese's peanut butter cups. So I'm glad my wife is in here to hear this because now if I want to get a Reese's peanut butter cup. <laughs> listen, they, look, what was not good to eat five years ago is supposed to be good to eat now. They tell us at one time, don't eat beef. Eat beef. Don't eat pork. No, eat pork. Don't eat this. No, eat that. I mean, it's always, always something that you're not supposed to eat, you can't eat. You can't eat it, you can't eat it. 
Paul said, I got a solution. Bless it. Give thanksgiving over it. Pray over it. And you don't have to worry about it. Now, I realize that there are some people, because of health reasons, that they should stay away from certain foods. I realize that. But it's not that it's forbidden. It's not that it's forbidden spiritually. That is not the reason. Health reasons, we understand. But Paul said, look, just pray over it. Pray over it. And so then he says here in verse 4, he says, every creature, as we said, is good. And nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and is sanctified by prayer. And one of the things that we understand is that everything we do as Christians, everything we do should be set apart, should be set apart. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 31, he says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. That means it's set apart for the glory of God. So marriage, eating, possessions are all spirit. They can all be spiritual issues because they're all given to us to be enjoyed. But we must understand the source and the source is that it comes from God, number one, and it's provided by God. And that's why we say prayers when we eat, right? We bless the food. We bless it because we acknowledge that it was God that created it and he said it was good. Number one. Number two, we bless it because God provided it. And we're thankful. So it's more a matter of thanksgiving. It even is just blessing the food. It's a matter of thanksgiving. And we see where Jesus Christ himself, before he would eat, he would give thanks for his food. When he sat down to feed the 5,000 in Matthew 14 and 19, before he distributed the food among the 5,000 people, he sat them all down and he gave thanks. Then he broke it and he distributed it. And the same thing even with the Passover, when he ate the Passover meal with his disciples. The Bible says that after he gave thanks, or when he gave thanks, he broke it and he distributed it. It is important that we give thanks to God when, you know, I love when I'm sitting in a restaurant and there's another family that's there and we see them praying together before they eat. I love seeing that. I love seeing that. I love seeing young kids who understand that I don't eat anything off this table until I give thanks. That's a wonderful thing. A wonderful thing. Give thanks. So then in verse 6, he goes on and he says, if you instruct the brethren in these things, in what things? In all the things we just got finished talking about. Instruct the brothers about these bad uh, false teachers. Instruct them about how to look out for these doctrines of demons and these deceiving spirits. Instruct the brethren about uh, setting things apart for the Lord's purpose and doing all things unto the Lord. He says, if you do that, then you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Nourished, I love this word, nourished in the words of faith. That word nourished, it's a powerful word. It means actually to be sustained, sustained by the words of faith, to be supplied with everything that's necessary for my life, for life and living and health. It's all, and my spiritual growth is all supplied to me, and I'm sustained through the words of faith. Through the words of faith, studying the word of God has impact on our lives in so many different areas. Obeying the word of God has impact in our lives in so many different areas. It sustains us. It sustains us. And then he says, it's a good minister of Jesus Christ who is sustained by the words of faith. It's a good minister that is supplied everything that is necessary for life through the word of God. 1 Timothy 4, 12 through 16 says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things and give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Let this encourage you at any age to have confidence in sharing the word of God with others. 
You've been listening to Living Waters of Grace. The teachings in this series are given by Pastor Lewis Harrell, an associate pastor at Calvary Chapel, Westmoreland. You'll be hearing periodically from Pastor Lewis as he serves alongside Pastor Clark. Pastor Clark has been the familiar voice of Grace FM, Living Waters of Grace. As we continue through the books of 1st and 2nd Timothy, you will be launched four years into the future of Timothy's ministry in Ephesus and see how this young leader matures and thrives under the encouragement of his mentor, Paul. Living Waters of Grace is a ministry out of Calvary Chapel, Westmoreland in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Are you in the area? We'd love to see you there this Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, head over to our website, calvarychapelonline.com. Once again, that website is calvarychapelonline.com. Thanks so much for listening to today's edition. We look forward to the next one right here on Living Waters of Grace.